I was lucky enough to actually see the short film we're going to talk about, um, and I I thought it was amazing. Uh, it's a short film that you can you can really relate to. Everybody's had a day job. Most people have dealt with customer service. Um, I'm going to let you tell my viewers a little bit about the plot. Okay, the story, uh, the film's called Roland. The short film's called Roland. Um, it's about the title character who uh, works at an art and supply store called Crafty's Art and Supply. And he's working one evening and a gentleman comes in wants to use the store's washroom. And the store has an employees only washroom policy. So that's kind of where the story then takes a turn. So uh, yeah, his evening gets a little bit worse from there. Now dealing with customers, you see the angriest of people. Uh, of all the complaints that you could have chosen, why the washroom? It actually is, believe it or not, it's actually based on a true story. Um, my co-writer, Niall Kelly, uh, it actually happened to him. He is the original Roland. Uh, we were trying to write a film for a while, um, a short film for a while, and one day he had that moment of like, hey, did I ever tell you about the time I worked at? And it was like, and, you know, sure, tell me. As soon as it was done, it was like, that's it. And I remember him being like, what? I'm like, uh, there was just something about the, I don't know, there's something about the beginning, middle, end of the story that I just like, I like it, went off, wrote it. And so, yeah, it's kind of one of those truth is stranger than fiction sort of ideas. Because, yes, writing a, doing a film about somebody who has to go to the washroom is not necessarily the most natural <laughs> natural choice. So, But it was perfect. It really worked out. I mean, you sat there thinking you might know where this is going because you maybe have been in the same sort of situation. Uh, but for it to escalate to where it goes, and I won't give too much away, um, it's just you sit there and you think, you know what, that could, that could easily happen on a daily basis to any one person. And it essentially did. Like, there are some dramatic arcs that we obviously took that are a little bit different than uh, what essentially happened, but the, the main plot points throughout, uh, even sort of the ending, are actual things that literally happen. So it wasn't one of those we said, well, here's a start, and we just, like, grew it into this whole other thing. We took some dramatic tones and licenses and stuff that like that were different, but otherwise it's, yeah, it's a true, true story. So it, uh, and for me, I liked it. For me, when I see uh, short films, and there's all sorts of short films out there, and whether it's experimental or narrative or animation or whatever, but I just, I like a story. I like, you know, a beginning, middle, and an end, or at least a beginning and an end. Something that when it's done, you can go... Ah, okay, that was a satisfying bit of, of entertainment or, or whatever that is, or story. And uh, that's what this sort of filled for me when, I was, uh, when we were writing it and heard it. And when it came to this project in particular, did you know that you were going to be entering it for the short film circuit? Um, well, yes and no. Um, I'll sort of say kind of naively a little bit. Um, I was kind of just doing it because I wanted to do it. Um, I've been in the film industry for 18 years and directing full-time for 13, uh, mainly more in the commercial uh, uh, TV side of, 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 of the business. And, um, and it was just a couple years, several years back, I just was getting a, I don't know, a little frustrated, wanted to expand a little bit, uh, try sort of tell a longer story. And so I started working on trying to do a short film just with the whole idea of just doing something else telling a longer story uh the end goal of it as far as like festivals and all that stuff i i don't think i was really thinking about that at the time of course when you talk like yeah of course i want to do that and even when we i think everyone does a short film or any sort of film they want it to be seen by people right. but it's not necessarily something that happens um all the time and and that's why i feel fortunate obviously with uh the interest and success it's had so far that's like oh wow this this could have gone potentially the other way where nobody cared and that would have been really upsetting after all that work. <laughs> and now that you've done VIF, will you go to different festivals? Have you submitted it to others? Yeah, so it's uh, just finished a, a bit of a run. It premiered at TIFF this year uh, in Toronto and uh, kind of did a, a quick succession of that to the Atlantic Film Festival, uh, Film North, uh, Vancouver, which has just uh, finished uh, down to... Tacoma Film Festival and is in San Francisco uh, right now. So there's a with the you know with the festivals like there's kind of little groups that kind of happen in bunches. So that's that little run for right now, and we're sort of waiting, waiting to hear on a few things for potentially November, uh, December. But you know I'm decided with this once we were done. Um, there's a couple ways you can go. You can put it on YouTube and or Vimeo and just go. All right, 
everyone take a look at it and see how many hits I got. Um, or you can do the festival world, which obviously you can't sort of do both at the same time. And so I decided I wanted to try the festivals and see how that worked. And, you know, I'll kind of run that for the next year. And uh, once that sort of reached its end, then I'll obviously at that point maybe jump over and put to YouTube or distribution or, or whatever. So. And so when, when you're, you're submitting it to the festivals, you're not allowed to put it online, obviously, for people to see. Um, do, does each festival give you a sort of amount of time that you have to wait to release it online, or you just wait until the entire thing is done? Um, there was a situation um, where TIFF this year did a, uh, an interesting uh, launch project, which they kind of got from Sundance uh, the previous year, where they actually did a uh, kind of an exclusive YouTube channel dedicated to TIFF, um, which it would run for a short time, um, somewhere in between like oh, two weeks or to five days, depending on when your film ran, where they would put it on this limited time uh, YouTube channel for shorts to, to be seen. Um, and Sundance had a huge success with it, and TIFF was launching it this year. And the idea was, hey, you know, if you have your film showing at a, a festival, um, maybe you get between 400 and 500 people might see your film, like for a short film. If you get, you know, that many hits on your, you know, if for that limit of time, it's almost like they've doubled their audience or tripled their audience of who could possibly see these films. And so, um, and there were some films definitely uh, with this year with TIFF that, you know, suddenly were in the hundreds of thousands, even up to a million hits because they caught a sensation and they just, boom. And that's, and maybe, um, uh, you know, potentially some of those films maybe didn't have long-term uh, um, uh, maybe distribution or other possibilities due to, you know, some sort of certain, so that was an excellent success of suddenly, you know, their film became something else and, you know, they were great and, 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 and so, but that was a, a unique thing that TIFF was able to do because they're, you know, kind of the biggest in the world sort of thing. It was a, where for most, uh, it's not. Um, it's a case of you can't have it sort of playing online. So it was like, mine was on for six days and then it was down very limited time and then it won't be up again until I'm kind of done with the festivals and go from there. Well, when that does happen, uh, I can't wait to, to actually share the short film that we are talking about with my viewers because it was, it was incredible. And uh, I have to ask you, as a director, how do you decide on the actors you're going to use? Your character, Roland, was just, he was unreal. He was amazing. Daniel Byrne. Uh, yes, he's a very, very talented man. Um, they can go see the trailer up until then to at least get a hint of maybe what the, uh, the, the story is about. Um, and I'm sure we'll give you the email stuff afterwards or we have mail afterwards um but uh yeah daniel byrne was the main uh character um i'd actually s saw him first in a commercial casting i was doing um sort of a year before and he came in and did this commercial casting and i just remember him walking out and i turned to my producer i'm like i think that's roland like he was just something about him the way he looked the way he acted i'm like i think that's the guy and so when we came back, like, you know, 10 months later or whatever, casting, I asked my cashier, like, could you please ask him? And, yeah, he came in. I got to admit, we had some great people come in for the role, but I kind of had all my eggs in that basket. Like, I was like, if he doesn't nail this, I'm not sure what I'm going to do because uh, he's just, in my eyes, perfect. And, yeah, he came in and nailed it. And he's a very, um, he's a very talented star on the rise um, uh, in his own right. So the fact that I was able to kind of get him before he exploded on the world is uh, just a nice bonus for me so and have you ever had that experience where you do have someone in mind you think they're perfect for the part they come into audition for the role and you're like you're not what I expected at all and you've had to, to change your mind yeah <laughs> a lot um it, it obviously depends on the type of casting you're doing certainly if you're doing commercial casting which is very you know, it's very sniper shots. You're finding very particular roles. You need to be dad who this and that or whatever. You know, you've had people here like, no, that person is it. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I saw their initial casting or, you know, and now I brought them back in for like their callback and just watched them blow it and just like, oh, and even like giving them the chance of like, look, go back out and, and I'm going to give you some notes and just, you know, take some time, go for a walk for 10 minutes and let's come back in here and just come back in and it's like, Wow. No. Okay. <laughs> I guess sometimes when you know when you're uh, you know when you're not when somebody's not on like at any job, uh, it's it doesn't work and it's uh, but uh, you know yeah sometimes that happens or you have an idea of somebody or once you see them it's like realizing it doesn't work that way or the other side is somebody else comes in that blows you away. 
you know, you have this idea in mind and somebody else comes in and it's like, oh, wow, actually, no, that's what I really want, not that. So while doing the casting for this one, did you already have other projects in mind and you sort of picked through the the casting auditions for your next project? I tried to. Um, like, I really was, I remember being really frustrated because I obviously have a bunch of really talented actor friends that I've worked with over the years. But for the particular roles that I had, I didn't really have anybody that, like, I was like, oh, you know, Greg would be perfect for this sort of thing. I, I didn't have anything like that uh it was it was uh there was actually only one there was one role uh in the film in particular it was a um another customer that comes into the store at one point in time and interacts with our main character and uh by a guy by the name of jordan mcclowski and he is somebody i'd worked with in the past and i actually kind of wrote his character very late uh, in, in production just to kind of like I wanted one more character and I in, in the end ended up basing it on him because I'd worked with him before and he was a, just an interesting guy and so I actually did kind of tailor his role for him but uh, that was the only one and that was very sort of late in the game that I kind of added him versus part of the initial story I wish I could have just gone alright Matt, Jenny, you but let's come on down and do a short film it would have been much much easier you would think so right? in, in future I'm going to try and keep that uh, in the back of my head it'll make uh, things a lot easier for myself now the girl that you used uh, she was more of a secondary character uh, she's standing at the till and uh, yes. you can tell she's you know She's not the best employee, we'll say, um, but she really she helps build the story. You can see Roland's frustration building and building, uh, not only with the customers he's now had to deal with, but the ones she keeps passing off on him. Uh, how do you how do you write a character that does so much without doing too much? If that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, she, this character, her name or character name's Tracy, anyways, and she's basically the only other employee that works at this store, and she's kind of that, you know, quasi art student slash goth girl slash kind of you know art store employee that we've all seen a lot before, and who just really doesn't want to be there, doesn't care, and uh, kind of passes everything off to this other person, and and uh, she was kind of my because. I don't think she was, she was not actually part of the, the original true story. She was somebody I added into it. And uh, she was, she's kind of my favorite character because in the end, you know, it doesn't, she doesn't do anything. Like she literally does nothing the entire film. And yet somehow every time she kind of comes in bits and pieces throughout the thing, I just, I find it funny because he's like there for a second and it's like, I got to go. And then she's just like gone within seconds. And so I always found that uh, very entertaining. Her, her last line of the film, which I got to go on break. That's her last, her last line. And she's done nothing the whole time. I, even I, I, we were just watching uh, another screening at, at, at VIF uh, yesterday. And I, I generally laugh at that line every time, <laughs> every time it happens. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Still, every time I see it, I still laugh at that line for some reason. Just cause. It's, it's just awesome. It's genuine. You know that that happens at everybody's job on a daily basis. There's there's that one person. Wherever you work, there's somebody who is Tracy. Uh, is the way we sort of put it. You've it, I don't care if you work in a you know an ice cream store or work at a you know a big office or a news organization or whatever you do, even the film industry. Yeah, you you know somebody like Tracy. Like, what are you doing here? Like, you're literally dragging the rest of us down with your just hate of doing this job so yeah anyway she was she was fun to write and she was fun to cast and Lindsay Clark who played uh, who played her um, who's not her at all uh, her she you know she's actually a, a very beautiful very beautiful woman very talented and she actually came in with like she had blonde hair and 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 she was one of these um, women that you know she could have totally gone the other way and played like you know uh, posh customer service person at Prada and it would have been like she also could have done that and or she's really snooty, but she was like, no, I need you kind of like this other thing. And she was like, okay. And she did it. And then I was like, ah, but your hair is blonde. She's like, oh, I'll just dye that. And she was just really totally got like, she totally was like, no, no, whatever it takes, I want to do this thing. I was like, all right, great. Actually, when we started one of the screenings, I didn't even recognize her. She had to like, it's Lindsay, remember? Like, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. good that people can just switch out their style like that. Uh, yeah, right? Now, relating to styles, I have one question that I try to ask most of my guests. Uh, it's actually about your socks. I think that you can tell a lot about a person um, 
by by their socks. Now you can literally hear. You could actually see the sawdust burning in my head right now, thinking, what socks did I wear today? <laughs> can you actually not remember? Um, I'm guessing uh, they're probably gray. I'm guessing they're gray. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to pull my socks up. Yep, they're gray. They're gray. Tommy Hilfiger? Uh, yeah, I think that was a, 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 a box of six at Costco, I'm pretty sure. Right? Not, not too much uh, <laughs> thrifty and practical uh, would be my sock choice, I guess. <laughs> and are they always gray? Is that sort of to match the tones in your closet? <laughs> A little bit. I guess, you know, there, there's shades of that. I got the odd argyle thrown in there for fun and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, for practical, practical everyday purposes, I'm going to go with, uh, with gray. That would definitely be the most unique question I've been asked in an interview. And I'm happy to hear that. It actually made me think probably the most of any one of <laughs> Like this panic of, like, one of them I wish I hadn't worn socks at all, and that would have been really entertaining. Uh, or... Uh, I wanted the one with like a hole right in it or something like that. Yeah, but then you would have been super uncomfortable and you'd probably be thinking about it through the whole interview. Yeah, at least for the rest of it anyways. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure speaking Thank with you. Thank you. Anytime.